fresh as possible. But Tim, uh, based on what Matt just reviewed and, and whatever else you want to hit on to open us up tonight, where's your head on this whole situation? Well, I, I, I've been wanting this defense to come together, just direly wanting this to happen because this season wasn't going to happen. We're going to watch arguably our greatest quarterback uh, ever in the history of Trojans kind of waste a year. And a guy with, uh, with uh, Bear Alexander, Matt, you're just talking about the fact it was one play. Well, actually, earlier we had a chance to get them to a fourth and four, and uh, it was an effort play, and Bear Alexander had, had that. By the way, the 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 um, – the um, targeting call that, that that he got called for. I mean, I'd love to talk about that one at some point, but uh, just unfortunate, you know, he, he doesn't hold up. That would have set up fourth and four on their side of the ball. Instead, they get a 15-yard penalty, uh, new set of downs, and they kept marching. Yeah, uh, Bryson Barnes played out of his mind. You know, this guy is, is, is a gussy performance, but this is not a team that should be putting almost up 500 yards total. It wasn't just the last drive. They put up 500 yards uh, of, of offense. And they are one of the, the worst offensive teams in, in all of college football. They're in the hundreds as far as total offense is concerned, um, yards per play, et cetera. And yet USC made them look amazing. Uh, the, it's not like they didn't have film. The week before, um, just, just a week before, you, you saw uh, them go off and just get some, uh, some juice on offense with um, Sione Vaki, their, their safety. Just come now. This guy is an insane two-way athlete. Uh, but he did mostly on the ground. Now he did it against USC through the air. I mean, the guy had uh, on, on uh, nine catches. What? No, how many catches did he have? He had five catches on six targets for 113, uh, so 149 yards and 113 yards after catch. I mean, they, they made this guy just look otherworldly. And as um, Michael Castillo has been said on his show, his post game show. The problem with this defense is, is they're making these guys who uh, are not all Americans look like all Americans. Every time a team plays USC, you have a true freshman going for almost you know 200 yards, 300 yards receiving. I can't remember what it was. There's huge numbers. Uh, 200 yards receiving against USC in a half, you know, and just torching them for the Colorado. You had Scadabo. I never heard of this guy before, but he, he's running through there like a force no one can stop. Uh, there's always a player that just USC can't stop. And it's not like, again, it wasn't like there was film. They didn't know this guy was coming. And it just seemed like they couldn't stop him. We were getting out-schemed. He was on linebackers and rush ends all day, and he was just torching them. And so uh, something has to change. I, you know, I, I, I wanted it not to be this year. I don't think it's going to be in. And, and people talk about getting fired midseason. None of that's going to happen. But it clearly is. There's something broken. Um and as a couple people have been saying in the media, it just looks like behind the scenes, some things don't sound right. Matt just came out that comment that Sean knew. I just, I just knew to me, Matt, uh, that you know, there's a lot of things going on. I've heard some rumblings of people saying there is stuff going on behind the locker room. I don't know any of this stuff. I am saying, though, though I think that Lincoln Rye is just sick, by the way, Matt. Let's not let the Oklahoma people get us all, you know, starting to read the tea leaves and stuff that he's leaving to the NFL and all this other stuff I've been hearing. Um, I, do, I do think I am concerned, though, which is the way this team has not been progressing. It's like the defense looked like they gave us some signs, and then they've just kind of regressed. And uh, at this point, this far into the season, uh, there's no excuses for these losses. Matt, when you throw out eight and four, is that just thinking, okay, the way this team is played, not just in the two losses, but in the previous weeks, Arizona, Arizona State in particular, that – just the standard Washington Oregon performance is too much for this football team. So if both teams put out their standard, let's say B performance, that those two teams are just playing better football and those most, most likely will be losses. And obviously the game at Austin brings that dynamic to it as well. Have we been watching Washington? Because well, they struggled against know, Arizona and Arizona sure State. Did. So let's not just hand <laughs> yeah. that one over. That one is at the Coliseum. We I'm did lose this game at question. home. But I'm not I'm not just gonna hand that game to Washington. No. The odds in that USC to lose a game this year, unfortunately, for my prediction record. But uh <laughs> so yeah. I haven't given up on him. I'm not sure about that one, but we'll see. Well, you know, you're not if, sure if about Washington, what? Oh, the Washington game. Sure. Yeah. If Washington plays if Washington in the Coliseum, if Washington plays the way it did against Arizona State, of course it's gonna lose. But 
if we see what you know a generally a you know a normal quote unquote normal performance, yeah, from Washington, Oregon, they will beat USC unless you know Caleb Williams somehow goes into God mode. But we you know we really haven't seen that much since the early part of the season against you know tomato can level opponents. So it's certainly looking like eight and four. And you know, you at UCLA is not going to be a picnic, but I think Caleb Williams and is not going to lose that game uh, at home. And I don't think Dante Moore is going to be ready to win that game. And I think USC, you know, will muster up whatever, you know, passion it has left, you know, to, to beat the Bruins. But yeah, the Washington, Oregon, like we, we all saw that Washington, Oregon game on October 14th. That was a big boy football game. I mean, Mark, you like, you're a college football historian. You've studied this sport closely. Like, I mean, as a kid, like growing up in the 80s, watching a Nebraska, Oklahoma game or watching a Miami, Florida State game, you know, those sprawling four hour games with all the athleticism, the hitting, the plot twists, you know, the, those games that just they feel like two games, but it's just one like Oregon, Washington fit into that kind of college football game. And so when Oregon and Washington are playing generally at, you know, the level they expect, like they are setting the bar several notches above anything USC has attained this season. And so, like, you know, I give USC extremely low odds of being able to beat uh, Washington or Oregon, you know, barring a, a, an Arizona State style clunker from the Huskies uh, on November 4th. I saw three to four college football games this year that would rival that game, not from a game standpoint, but having as much or more talent on the field headlined by Ohio State and Penn State. Uh, LSU, Florida State, Texas, Alabama comes to mind. But those games, none of them were as well played as that game. I would rank some of those matchups to be better talent on the field, but they didn't come together and play great games on both sides of that stadium at the same time as those two teams did on that day. That was a that was a scintillating game, probably the best college football game of the year thus far in terms of yeah. high-level play by both sides. Uh, two very talented teams, uh, high leverage game. Absolutely.